Hey, what's up, everybody? We got Championship Leadership Podcast here today, and uh, I'm excited. We have John Allen. He's a former former Navy SEAL, um, CEO of Elite Meat, and also partner, creator, founder of Operators Association. Uh, so, thanks. Appreciate you being here today, John. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, Nate. I'm happy to be here, man. Absolutely. Um, so, first question is, you know, the name of the podcast, Championship Leadership. What comes to mind for you, or what does that mean to you when you hear that? Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think championship leadership, I mean, if you just look at the words, it's like people that are really, really good at leading. Um, and if the, if the reason I'm on here is the assumption that I'm really good at leading, then I'm probably not a good guest. I'm still learning how to, <laughs> to lead. I've been around really excellent, like champion level leaders for sure. Yeah. Um, and they stand out because anytime you're, you're under the kind of tutelage of someone that really is a champion leader you remember that person. It has a profound impact on you. And so I, I spend every day trying to embody the best characteristics of those people, but probably fall uh, way short. Yeah. Well, and I think most championship level leaders would give that answer. They wouldn't call themselves championship leaders, but, uh, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I definitely appreciate the fact that like, yeah, man, I mean, it's always a ever flowing thing, continually trying to get a little bit better. Um, well, talk, talk to me maybe a little bit, you know, you don't have to name them by names, but who are some of those folks that, that you look to or that uh, automatically come to mind for you um, as championship level leaders and not so much like who they are, but really, you know, what kind of impact did, did they make on you? What was it about them that really stood out that made them great leaders? Uh, and then maybe that you've taken in, in kind of helps you become who you are and what you're doing today. Yeah, so there, there's actually one person, uh, yeah, not by name, but there, when I first mm -hmm. got, actually, there's, there's necessary context. So when you go through SEAL training, it's a fairly lengthy upfront process that takes, you know, give or take about a year and a half, two years. Um, but the interesting thing about it is while you're in training, um, you're, you're kind of reminded by the cadre teaching you that, like, you're being built up to become what they call outside the box thinkers. It's something that the Navy really prides themselves in having in the SEAL teams. And so you believe as you're kind of coming up to the ranks, going through the selection course and going through all the follow on training that like somehow you're not, you're not, uh, you're not being indoctrinated as much as having your mind opened. You're, you're not actively thinking about it. It's like, when you think of the military from someone that's never served, you kind of, you imagine boot camp as being this indoctrination process. Like it has to be, yeah. you're like learning how to join the military and with that comes discipline and good order. But with SEAL training, it's almost like um, they want you to not feel like that's happening. Uh, and so you really have this belief that you're this, you and your classmates as you're going through this process are like these free thinking, like smart, you know, self-aware people. But in reality, what actually happens is, is you're training really inside of a bubble. It's not real life. You may think it's real life, but you're, you're in this really intense course and you're actually being completely indoctrinated. You just don't realize it. Yeah. You're being indoctrinated to like look for other ways to solve problems, but you're doing it inside of a vacuum and you don't realize it until you get to a team. And the reason I'm saying all this is when you're in training, because it takes so long, you start to almost believe that the job of a Navy SEAL is to train because there's just so much up front of it and you lose sight. And this is where the vacuum piece comes in. So you look, you lose sight of the actual stakes that you're going to be playing with once you get to a team, which are truly life and death. Yeah. Um, and when you, when I got to a team, I remember all of us that had been freshly minted Navy SEALs. We, we didn't say this, but we had this like quiet confidence that the course really instills in you on purpose that we really felt like we were outside the box thinkers and we were very self-aware. And even though we were new, we just lacked the necessary experience, you know, that we would get at a team. But then when we got to a team, it was like your blinders, you know, came off because, you know, I checked into a team and I'm meeting people that have employed all of these skills in actual combat scenarios. And they acted entirely different than we all did. We had this mm -hmm. naive excitement and like we were really, really, really well trained, but had never actually used it in real life. And so we were just missing with this critical, almost emotional component of what this job is. And I remember the, the person who was in charge of our platoon, he was not a guy that, you know, stood up and like rallied the troops or anything. 
but he had had, you know, multiple combat tours and he just like lived the life of an absolute professional warfighter. And instead of like saying, Hey, you guys don't know what you're doing. It was like, he was constantly finding ways to like bring us into kind of his circle and mentor us, but without putting us down for lacking the experience that we just simply didn't have. It was like, he understood we were totally naive, but we were not aware of it. And so he would just bring us into, into kind of his, his wing and he would like teach us, but in a way that was empowering. Um, I also remember he specifically, um, he was able to kind of ride the line between being in charge. And so like, you know, providing that kind of disciplinary backbone of a good, you know, leader, but yeah. also understood when to kind of slack back and, and be friendly with people. It was like, he could ride the line between I'm completely in charge, but I'm also your friend. And yeah. I've seen people kind of go one way or the other, and that makes a bad leader a lot of times. Yeah. And so striking a balance between, you know, empathy and like strict leadership and being aware of the, the kind of blind spots that your team has. And in our case, being you guys, when we show up, we're, we're totally blind. We have no experience. And yeah. instead of chastising us and hazing us, it yeah. was like, here, let me teach you, but without you realizing that I'm actually pointing out how naive and inexperienced you are. And that really stood yeah. out to me. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. And uh, I mean, what was your experience inside of the teams and inside of uh, being a Navy SEAL? Was it, you know, I think from the outside looking in, there's this, there's this thought of what Navy SEALs, who they are and the level that they operate at and that all, all of the leaders would be that way, right? But, but what's the reality? Like Navy SEALs are people and humans just like others and there's gonna be great leaders and maybe not as great leaders even in the Navy SEALs, um, I, I would imagine. So that, I guess that's more of the question to you. Um, you know, did you see different levels of, of leadership inside of the teams and were you able to really kind of pick up on some of that as you went through your experience? Yeah, no, I mean, much like any other organization, there are good and bad leaders, the same way there are good and bad followers, there are good and bad everything. Yeah. Um, it's, it, when you have human beings, like in an organization, there are going to be people that rise to the top and those that fall to the bottom. With the SEAL teams, you have a collective baseline that's far higher than the average you know, yeah. military person, but yeah. it doesn't take away the very human side of being human and, and having yeah. faults and uh, having egos to get in the way. And so I would say that it, it's, it's like the disparity between a really good leader and a bad leader was fairly, fairly small because sure. everybody was fairly, was extremely competent and knew what to do. But because everyone's at like, like that upper percentage point, it seemed like massive. Uh, it seemed like the disparity was massive between yeah. the really excellent leadership and the subpar leadership, even though I bet that subpar leader could be a great leader great. in the regular military. Yeah, so absolutely. I'd say, yeah, it's up, to, up and down, same as anything else, same as any other organization. Yeah. So we'll talk maybe a little bit about, um, you know, transition out and, and where did Elite Meet come, come about? So I, when I joined, so I joined the Navy in 2010 and got through training by 2012, checked into a SEAL team. And, you know, by the time you're checking in, you know, it's, it's been a couple of years of training and, and the attrition rate is so high that by the time you get to a team, you do really feel like you, you've accomplished something massive. Mm -hmm. And so nobody gets to a team and says, I'm going to get out after the next four years. It's like, I'm going to do a career. And it's, it's yeah. so, it's, it's such a, a common assumption that it's not even really discussed. Like if I'm going to put in this time, I'm going to do a full career, which is 20 years. But ironically, it's very common for people in special operations to get out after one contract, which is typical well, six years. Um, and that's because, you know, you go in with an expectation and then you see reality. And it isn't that, you know, one is better than the other, but it's, it's very common when you're when you are going into a world that you frankly, especially now with the, the proliferation of the SEAL brand, you, romant you, you romanticize what it's going to be like, like what combat's yeah. going to be like, what war is going to be like, what the brotherhood's going to be like. And then there's reality um, in the same way that in any organization, there's good and bad leadership. Well, in any job, there's pros and cons. And I think a lot of people get to the team uh, and are struck by the kind of stark reality of the difficulty of the job, the stress of the job. Um, and so I definitely had that. Um, but for me, what ultimately got me to leave early was, my first uh, tour, I went to Afghanistan, which is like hitting the lottery, um, you know, as a SEAL, because you do all this training, the last thing you want to do is, is not use it. 
Yeah. Um, and so I got the opportunity to go to Afghanistan and, you know, our deployment was every bit the kind of kinetic deployment I was hoping for. Um, but at the end of it, the, at the five month mark, it was a six month deployment. We got effectively ambushed and a grenade detonated next to me. Um, you know, nearly, I, I nearly died, but luckily my medic saved my life and I got medevaced out of Afghanistan, uh, back to the States through Germany, the whole kind of combat, you know, injury medevac process. Um, and, uh, you know, I was fortunate I kept my limbs, but it was one of those like truly close calls where, um, it was like kind of a miracle that I lived and, and everybody knew it. Uh, and when I got back home to Virginia with my wife, um, it, it didn't happen right away, but it was like, you know, is this really what we're going to do for the next, you know, 16 years? This is like the life we're going to live. And I was pretty shaken up by it. I, I was also starting to have my own second thoughts about whether this was the kind of life I wanted independent of, you know, the injury, but the two of those things combined really set me on a path where I decided that even though I still have four years remaining in the military, that when that ends, I'm actually going to get out and pursue something else. I felt like my luck had run out and I really was fortunate to be alive. Um, and then through a series of bizarre events, um, it turned out that my medical issues became a bigger issue uh, as my kind of timeline wound down. And I ultimately was put on what's called a medical board and was actually medically retired, which is considering I was trying to get out. It's actually, it's a huge win for me since it's, you know, you, you basically artificially are given the benefits of doing 20 years in the military. Yeah. Um, but my timeline was accelerated out of the military. That's to make it a short story. Yeah. I went from thinking I have two years to prepare and I plan on going to business school and then, you know, going and being a consultant at like a, a one of the big firms. To I have eight weeks until I'm going to be out on the street uh, and I need a job. And so it was in that kind of panicky space looking for a job where I connected with some people in New York, came up with this idea to host this networking event where selfishly I wanted to go to the event and meet future employers because I needed a job. Uh, but I invited my buddies coming out of the SEAL team to come with me to meet some people in New York. And we have this networking event that the, uh, the Navy SEAL Foundation threw us some money to go do. And it was just one of those things where like, we're not inventing anything new. I mean, networking events are not even close to a new thing, but yeah. the population of people I brought to the table were like ready to get out of the military, people from some of the elite places in the military looking for jobs in New York. And I found like some interesting employers in New York that were looking for veterans, but had really never experienced Navy SEALs or any of these guys. You put them in the room and it was like magic. And I, it was like, I didn't have to do anything else because I had already struck a chord that was perfect. Um, so ironically, I didn't get a job out of that event. Nobody actually approached me about getting a job. Uh -huh. The assumption was my job was running these networking events. Um, but five other veterans of the 20 that went got to offer jobs, two of them accepted. And within a couple of days of this event, you have people with full-time jobs in New York that have like struck gold oh, wow. and there was money to go do another event because employers wanted more foundations wanted more. There was this big push to like do another one. Um, and that was kind of the catalyst behind elite meet what started as this one time event turned into we'll do one more and I was like great I can get a job through that one but then the money kept coming in from sponsors and donors and and there was enough of an interest from the veteran side that we turned it into a charity and three years later we now host these huge events all over the country uh, we have a thriving online community and we're getting ready to build a marketplace where employers uh, can actually have direct access to our veterans but it's kind of like a private invite only channel um, and this is what I do full time. I, I run Elite Me as a CEO. Yeah, that's incredible. So, what's what's a big vision for you uh, with Elite Me? Like five years. Um, well, yeah. So there, we 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 put our hands in a bunch of things. There's been like the mentorship component because you know the veterans were helping. One of the bigger issues they have to solve is they have this this plethora of experience, like millions and millions of dollars of, of experience that goes well beyond the battlefield. It's like, you know, negotiations, uh, situational awareness, language training, leadership training. There's all these skills that they, they're given, but they're hard to sell. Um, and this group is notoriously uh, tight-lipped and, and, and reserved about advertising themselves, despite what you see if you Google Navy SEAL. Um, and that includes me too, certainly. But, uh, you know, it's like this group is kind of reserved. And so we tried the mentorship thing, but to be honest, trying to manage like connecting mentor with veteran and tracking those relationships proved to be so difficult. And so there's all these other organizations out there that offer this. 
And we were like, you know what, let's stop trying to do a bunch of other things and do what we're really good at, which is really just high end networking for a very specific group of veterans and a specific group of employers. And so we've trimmed our program down to three major events, these kind of like multi-day conferences. Uh, we'll do three in 2020 in LA, Chicago, and Dallas. And then we'll have probably three to five single day events. Um, and we're really in the middle of building a platform where vetted employers can gain credentials to this platform and vetted you know, veterans can, who are elite members gain access to this platform and then they can actually interact with each other, much like a LinkedIn private channel, except yeah. we've tried doing these already existing platforms and the people that we want to be on these platforms, they don't feel like they're secure enough. They don't feel like they're exclusive enough. And so we're building kind of a separate entity um, where really the vision is, I want Elite Me to be much more automated because there's too much of a human brokerage component between our network and our veterans. And it's it's gotten big enough that when you have human beings that are fostering or creating these relationships where a veteran's like, I want to work at this company. Uh, well, they have to go through one of our staff members to get to that person. And yeah. imagine if you have 20 people that want that in a given day. I mean, that's like your whole day setting right. up email intros. And so we want to shift to automation um, and keep it highly exclusive. And so that's actually the direction we're going is events. So you have that physical networking component and then a really intuitive and simple marketplace for high-end employers to meet high-end job talent on its own platform to kind of supplement the the live events so networking digitally and live yeah uh, it's incredible and uh I, you know obviously there was a big need for it too as well because of the kind of the speed of of how it was created and in the success that you had inside of that we talk a little bit now. You also with Zach Hughes, your partner, um, business partner, through Operators yep. Association. Like, what exactly is that? How did how did that like morph? Came and, to be. You know, how did yeah. that come to be? Yeah. So uh, early on, so in 2017, when Elite when Elite Meet first started, really in earnest, Elite Meet didn't actually really start functioning as a a business until the end of 2017, but. I, I mean, I was, I was the primary fundraiser and actually today I'm still like the 90% fundraiser guy. Um, and I had no clue how to raise money, real money. I mean, it's one yeah. thing to like walk around and ask for a couple bucks, but to be raising right. the amount of money we needed because we were going to be, one of the things we do is we fly our veterans all over the country to these like lavish events where they're meeting these amazing people, but we're putting a lot of money down um, just to make that possible. So we want to make sure that once the veterans are in, they're not paying for it. That's a lot of money. And, um, you know, it was like, I didn't have the understanding of how to like put together a huge fundraiser. I mean, it seems simple, but the reality is you're putting a lot of money into it and you're gambling, you're going to recoup it and then some. Yeah. But I found that, uh, you know, LinkedIn was this great platform to kind of uh, tell stories that kind of captured the readers, uh, the audience, in a way that kind of compelled them to want to learn more about social operations. And I kind of began funneling people through my own stories about my own experience and how it's translated to business, kind of like almost like a, a daily vlog, if you will, on LinkedIn or not a blog, yeah. a, a blog. Yeah. People were so interested in my experience because it was being written, not from a war memoir perspective, but from a like, here are things that my job kind of does for me now in the civilian world. Um, and people were really drawn to it. And it was like a perfect funnel to elite me. People would be interested in my content that was basically the exceptionalism of, of you know, Navy SEAL skills and how they translate to business. And as, as soon as somebody reached out to me that was interested, it, that I could, I kind of screened the profile. Um, I would say, well, hey, you know, if this is of interest to you, you should really look at our, our program, Elite Me, which is this whole organization of people way more, way more accomplished than me that are much like me, but better, that are over here and you should participate. And so we created this funnel of donors and sponsors almost entirely from LinkedIn. Um, and so using that formula in the first year, we raised like $300,000 purely from LinkedIn. Um, and then in 20, it, this year we raised through LinkedIn about $500,000. And this is not like one person comes in and says, here's a bajillion dollars. It's yeah, like, right. oh, cool, yeah. I'll contribute a thousand dollars, but like yeah. on repeat every day. And so, all that's to say is the social media side, particularly on LinkedIn, really took off. But the the way it was the way we were funneling people to Elite Me was through stories about my SEAL experience and select other people on the team. 
And then we transferred to Instagram because Instagram's got a huge, it's a much larger population of users. It's a different user base. So we're like, hey, it works on LinkedIn. Maybe we can get it to work on Instagram. I go to Instagram and start kind of taking old content and putting it on there. And it, it totally caught on and people were really interested, but it wasn't people looking to go to Elite Meet. It was people looking to learn how to become a Navy SEAL. Yeah, Same content, right. but different demographics, so different results. Um, and so at first it was a little bit frustrating because it seemed like, well, what's the point? Because the whole goal of this <laughs> yeah. the funnel really did to monetize. Yeah. Um, but at some point, like I actually really enjoy, um, you know, mentoring the next generation. So it isn't like this is like a burden, but I, it's hard to justify when I have a business to run. Yeah. And so at first you're like, let's create this platform where aspiring operators can learn something from me and other operators in Elite Meet, but it'll be a fundraising tool for Elite Meet. We built this chat room where elite meet members that, that, that were comfortable being mentors would be on this chat room. And then we'd have guys pay on the, on the aspiring operator side to chat with them on this, on this chat room. And it was a donation to elite meet like your subscription. And it, it was a, this perfect yeah. thing on paper. Yeah. But what quickly happened is some of the information that was being exchanged really on both sides was bordering on inappropriate, yeah. um, just like in terms of sensitivity. And I was like, this could cause huge problems for elite meet if somebody screenshots some of the information being passed. And so we initially were like, let's shut this thing down, even though it's raising a tiny bit of money for elite meet. Um, you know, it's just not worth the risk. Um, and we did shut it down, but then there was all these people that were like, well, even if we don't have the chat room, we'd still love to, you know, participate in some way and learn from you. And uh, we decided and my board actually said, we don't want to be, we don't want to have this as a fundraising tool. So don't make it a part of elite meet. And we're like, all right, we'll just start a separate business that's just like a mentorship platform. And people, they sign up and they get all this extra content. And they do live streams with Zach and I. Um, we have three podcasts we put out every single week. Um, and it's just become like, a, you know, just like a mentorship tool, but like the price of entry is like five bucks. And you can pretty much binge like 100 hours of content for five bucks. Oh, wow. um, and so it's like this really excellent tool. Um, but because it's, it's, it's not a fundraising tool anymore, it had to become a separate business. And so what started as like this thing for elite meat eventually was divorced and made its own entity. And it's since really taken off because now being its own kind of for-profit entity, Zach and I have a little bit more leverage to do what we want with it. And it's become a fairly thriving thing. And we already have people getting through selection, green beret selection. We have guys in seal training that are coming out of our program and so far so good. Yeah, and imagine, you know, down the road, obviously, that will feed into Elite Meet as well, of course. Um, exactly. It's a great plug for Elite Meet, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's great. And, that, and you know, I can only imagine that it's, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, young uh, individuals out there that, like, there's a massive need for that, right? Because I imagine there wasn't really anything like that for you when you were get, getting prepared to go through BUDS. No, I mean, there's actually, there's a plethora of information, but unless you have someone that can say what is real, what is not, and what you can believe, what you can't believe, uh, it ends up being kind of worthless to you. I mean, if you Google right now how to become a Navy SEAL, you'll find like 85 <laughs> variations of how to do it. Yeah. When it's like, I could tell you, and I actually made a video that I've, I've been given, just give the people for free, which yeah. is like, just follow these steps. It's actually really straightforward. But yeah, just providing like concrete, and not, not embellish, not trying to be like, we're the gatekeepers, but rather like, hey, here's some really practical information um, that as soon as you sign up, you get all of it. If you want more, stick around. Yeah, yeah, incredible, cool. And what's, what's the vision there? Like, yeah, what, what are you guys really looking to accomplish there? Do you want to grow to a certain size? Um, have you even thought about that? Yeah, and so we, we, we built it originally, again, as an elite meet thing yeah. in uh, June of this year. And then with the chat room thing being shut down and then really being unclear about what it was going to be, we didn't start like um, Zach and I start really pushing on it as a separate entity until really August. And so over the course of August, September, so basically four months, is that right? August, yep. September, October, yeah, five months. Yep. Um, it's grown pretty quickly. And now, you know, it's doing like the equivalent of like maybe a hundred K in revenue a year. Obviously we haven't done a year yet. And yeah. it's really manageable as it is now. And it's really valuable as it is now. And so Zach and I are deciding whether do we even want to scale it up or is yeah. it kind of as it is a really effective tool that we can kind of always keep as a side hustle that we don't scale so fast that it falls apart and it gives people what they want. So we don't really know. Um, I think mm -hmm. that there's, there's an avenue to kind of expand what it is 
and maybe instead of it being highly focused on operators, aspiring operators, I should say, it could be, you know, more kind of holistic, maybe like fitness and, you know, life coaching or something. But then you run the risk of diluting what you got. And so we've been beta testing a couple pieces of content to see what people want. Um, but it wouldn't shock me if it kind of stayed where it is uh, because it's easy to manage now and it's, it's get pro providing value. I think we'll probably use that model of like a Patreon page that provides a specific niche group, specific information and yeah. community, but with like another group, right? Like a, a fitness one or, yeah. you know, uh, or even a Patreon page that is how to build a Patreon page because there's a lot of misinformation around that too. So yeah. questions, questions for well, sure. Not really sure where we're going to go. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I know I'm going to respect your time here and I know, uh, but I, I got a few more questions for you. Sure. Absolutely. Um, what, uh, what, you know, coming out of the, out of the seals, like, like it happened and not obviously as you probably imagined it or it was scripted, of course, but the way it happened, you know, this entrepreneurial spirit that you have, this success that you're having running Elite Meet and, and creating the Operators Association and just listening to you talk and very clearly uh, a, a skill set or a, uh, a strength that you have, is that something that you always kind of knew uh, that this would be the path for you or, or, or what has it been for you like coming into this? Not to make this overly dramatic, but I actually recently was, uh, I was asked by somebody that had survived cancer uh, that I'm friends with. He had stage four cancer and he, uh, he, he wrote a book called Survivor's Obligation of basically what he's going to do with this part of his life that, you know, he's been granted because there was a time where he really believed it was the end of his life. And he and I are friends and he was like, look, I know you had a close call in Afghanistan. Would you want to talk a little bit about what your survivor's obligation is. And I thought about it. And of course I said, yeah, I'd love to do that. I'd love to provide a testimonial. Yeah. Um, but I thought about it. And um, one of the interesting things that I kind of realized in doing this video was, you know, that injury where this grenade actually hits my shoulder and lands next to me. And I have this moment in time where um, I believe I'm about to die and it's not sad. It's not crazy. It's just kind of factual. It's like, you know, it's about to happen. Obviously, I don't, and my medic ends up putting tourniquets on me, saves my life. But when I came back, um, and I'm still in the military, this is 2014, I desperately wanted to, to, to almost put meaning to that experience. I wanted to have that kind of life-changing perspective that it, it seems like everybody who has a near-death experience, at least how it's portrayed in movies and books and in biographies, whatever it is, people seem to have this epiphany of, oh my God, you know, I, I nearly died. And now this is how my life looks. Yeah. And for me, it was like I had this very disassociative experience where I could tell the story about what happened in vivid detail, but there was no emotional connection to it. It was like it, it had not happened to me. And it wasn't until I got out of the military and this is, so this is 2014, I'm like looking for meaning for years. I just didn't have it. And I was frustrated. There's no meaning to it. Um, and then I got out of the military and with my exit being, you know, I was anticipating those two years and going to business school and then no, just kidding. You have eight weeks and all of a sudden I'm doing elite meet, which wasn't even supposed to be a thing, but now it is. And now I'm on, yeah. I'm on phone calls with people raising money. And it was like, all of a sudden I'm doing this entrepreneurship thing. But what I found is the, the risk that you take with being an entrepreneur is something that I don't even worry about. What I worry about is frankly, just being totally blunt, I'm worried that I will die before I have the opportunity to accomplish the things that I know I'm capable of, whether it's an elite meet or operators association or other ventures. Yeah. And on reflecting on that whole survivor's obligation uh, that this guy sent and he said, I can use video. I realized that I have a profound sense of urgency that I never had in my life that is manifesting itself right now because I'm looking to build businesses. And so where I think a lot of other entrepreneurs and I'm making a big sweeping generalization, but they're worried about things like fundraising and making payroll and strategic decision-making, getting rid of co-founders, adding team members, there's all these practical things. I'm concerned that I will die before I have the opportunity to even have those problems. Yeah, and it wow. pushes me in a way that like there is, there's no risk involved that's going to stop me. It's, it's just how much time do I have in the day to pack things into it? And I really think that stems from that experience in Afghanistan, but it took years to kind of manifest. 
and, it, and it's through entrepreneurship that I'm kind of gaining that perspective, which is you have no time. You're going to, you're going to die someday. So you have no time to do it right now. And so yeah. I think that was, the, that, that came out of that experience. I don't think I'd make a great entrepreneur had I not been nearly killed. I would have gotten out and been like, this is pretty good. I'll take yeah. a job, you know, whatever. I'll, I'll kind of sit back and hang out with my family, but not now. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, well, knowing how it played out, of course, do you look at that as like a gift? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I know that that's a hard perspective maybe for some some to see, but yeah, just hearing it play out and the urgency that you have, right? And just, uh, that's incredible. So I uh, appreciate you being here. Uh, I do have one last question, just like one or two Great. things for the listeners um, that you could give them a piece of advice, maybe some guiding principles that you live by that they could take and implement into their life uh, today to help them move forward, you get anything for them. Yeah, so I do. Uh, I don't know if this is something that you can even employ or not, but it's something that maybe I just naturally do. Yeah. Um, the, the, th the times in my life where I've been the most successful, which I can point to them, it's like getting through SEAL training, uh, you know, taking elite meat from really neat idea to fully funded organization that like works. Uh, OA is another one. We're not sure where it's going to go, but that's another one. I have these like distinct moments in my life where like things have gone really, really well. Um, and it's no coincidence that when the work needed to happen to make those things a reality, I was singularly focused. Mm -hmm. I wasn't trying to multitask on other things. I was solely focused on one outcome that I never lost sight of. For the SEAL teams, it was like, I'm going to graduate this course. So that when it got really hard, it was not a matter of should I stay or go, like a lot of people will quit the course when it gets hard. It was yeah this really sucks. I can't wait for it to be over. And so everything became an imperative. The things that I wanted in my life became an imperative and I didn't think about anything else. This has the potential to destroy other things in your life. But if you want to be really, really good at one thing, if you want to accomplish one goal, you need to find a way to divorce everything else out of your life and put all of your energy into it. And so I've done that really on, on definitely two different occasions with the SEAL, the SEAL stuff and with Elite Meet. Um, I'm doing it now with OA. It's a dangerous thing, but if, if you want to hit a goal, you got to learn how to be singularly focused to the, almost to a fault. And if you do it and you can manage your life that way, you can be hyper successful at one thing, but it may yeah. be at the expense of other things. So you got to, you got to play with that delicately. Yeah, no, and that's great advice, especially today. Cause we are, uh, we are pulled in so many directions and it can be easy to get distracted or, or to not. So yeah, I appreciate that. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. What, what are a few ways that we can uh, find more about you guys and what you got going on? Follow yeah. You. So for, for elite meat, if you just go to elite .us, um, we couldn't get the com. It was already owned by some dating service. So we have us, but it's patriotic. So you remember it that way. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you go to elite .us, If you're a veteran that wants to get involved and be a part of elite meat, anybody can apply. We do have a focus on special operators and fighter pilots, but there's a small percentage of, you know, non-core demo that gets in. So if you're interested, go to leadmeet.us and just go to veteran application. It's very simple. Uh, same goes for employers. If you're interested, go to our website. There's also an application. It's actually down today, but it'll be up. Well, whenever you're watching this, it's probably up. Yeah. Um, you can apply to go to an event, get access to our talent pool, that kind of thing. Um, really, our social channels for Elite Meet are a little bit subdued. It's more through my page on LinkedIn. So if you go to John Allen, probably you have to type it in in Google like John Allen elite me, it'll probably pull it up on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, that's how you, that's kind of how you get in touch with elite Meet, the website and my LinkedIn and then Zach Hughes as well. Uh, he's the COO. And then uh, beyond that, I mean, I, I'm pretty active on social media, LinkedIn, Instagram, my handle is John B Allen 416. Um, and I just got on TikTok. I'm going down the TikTok rabbit hole. Uh, you? John B. Allen 416. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yo, dude, it's crazy. I, I, I it posted is. it. It's so it's new and like no yeah. one really knows how it works yet. Yeah. And everyone's freaked out because a Chinese company owns it. But even yeah. beyond that, I posted a video on uh, three days ago and it literally took me 15, well, it took me about 60 seconds to record it. Yeah. It was, it was uh, the scariest part of Navy SEAL training because the okay. demographic on TikTok is these young kids that are thinking about being SEALs. And I was like, oh, I, and by the way, I had no following, nothing. Like yeah, yeah. a couple hundred people following me. No one knows who I am or anything. I just threw it up there. It's yeah. got 4.2 million views. No and way. It is. What? Yeah, dude, 4.2 million. <laughs> and it like, it turned my profile from no following 
to like 120,000 people that follow me that like all of a sudden I have a platform. But the crazy thing is, is it's because the algorithm on TikTok, it's not set up the way Instagram is. Instagram, yeah. it's like you get 10% reach. Even if your yeah. post is amazing, you need other people to share your post for it to go yeah. viral. TikTok, it only cares how good your content is. And if it's good enough, it'll just blow it up. And so if you're, if you're thinking about blowing up any social media accounts, go to TikTok because right now, basically just posting stuff gets you a follow. Right, well, so even though TikTok. you didn't ask about it, I would go on TikTok. Yeah, I've been thinking about it forever and I'm like, all right, that's, uh, I think that's all I needed. So that's, yeah. <laughs> that's incredible. It's crazy, man. Literally yeah. like, and it's, it's all about like, just like selfie candid videos that are like kind of low, like no one's doing like the, the Instagram, like really high end video editing. Right. It's literally like got people like in their bathroom, like filming the mirror, like saying yeah. something stupid and like <laughs> it gets 70 million views. It's just, like it's brand new and no, nothing's yeah. really pro professional yet. But right. definitely check it out. All right, will do. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for yeah. being here. Right on. Take care, man. Thank you. Yeah, you too.